Every child goes through stages of development, uh, from the cradle of infancy to the uh, creation of words and the crawling of tiny arms and legs. Children go through phases of figuring out how the world works. And there comes the time in, when an infant becomes a toddler and a toddler becomes a detective. You know what I'm talking about? Now, the parents in the room will know what I'm talking about when a four-year-old won't stop asking questions. It usually starts with questions about how the world works. Where does the sun go at night? Where do bananas come from? Where does milk come from? Where does rain come from? Where do babies come from? And we change the subject. And then there comes the stage when every question starts with why. Why is grass green? Why can't I have a lollipop for breakfast? Why can't vegetables taste like chicken? Why can't we grow sausage in the garden? And ex exhausting as these why questions must get, I imagine that there are moments when the incessant questions of little toddlers come to parents with a measure of conviction. Because they force us to articulate the reasons why. The reasons behind why we do what we do. The motivation behind our actions. Why do we go to church? Why do we pray? Why do we only pray when grandma is here? Why do we sing at church? Why do you put money in the plate when they pass it? at church? Why do we only talk about God on Sundays? Why were you angry in the car but nice when we went to church? And the inquisitiveness of kids can be convicting because it forces us to realize that sometimes we do the right things for the wrong reasons. As we continue this morning in our series in the Sermon on the Mount, we come to Matthew chapter 6. It's a new section in Jesus' unfolding message of what the kingdom of God is like, what people who've chosen to follow Jesus, what their lives look like. And I believe that the overarching question as we head into chapter 6 of Matthew Matthew's gospel this morning is Jesus' overarching question is why? When it comes to the Christian life, what's your motivation? And I think that Jesus' words might come this morning with a measure of conviction because we're going to see in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, that sometimes... Doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in Jesus' eyes. I'll say that again, that doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in Jesus' eyes. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 4. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And here's what we read. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Jesus sets up the, oh, the whole next uh, few sections with that verse right there. And then... Here, in verses 2 through 4, he's going to give an example. Verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, 
who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus wants us to realize that doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in his eyes. Jesus is asking why. What's your motivation? When you, for example, give to the poor, when you give at church, when you go to church, when you read your Bible, when you pray with someone, what's your motivation? And Jesus, what he does here in this passage is he sets a stark contrast between hypocrisy and true righteousness. We've seen throughout the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is really concerned about true righteousness. Not the kind of righteousness that looks good on the outside, but the kind of righteousness that comes from transformation. And what Jesus is, is communicating to us all throughout this Sermon on the Mount is that kingdom people aren't people who are about religious performance, but they're about spiritual transformation. Hypocrisy, this word, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. Beware of being like the hypocrites. This word here, we actually get this word from the uh, ancient Greek origin. It, the, the, the word is almost transliterated from Greek to English. And the word was used of Greek actors in the theater. The hypocrites would be people who wore masks in the theater and they would, at the time, there were just males in the Greek theater arena. And so whenever there would be a female in a play, they would put on a mask to become a female. And it is this performance, it's this front, it's becoming someone who you're not. That is hypocrisy. And Jesus is warning us of the dangers of hypocrisy. I'll tell you time and time again, I will meet someone. They'll learn that I'm a pastor. They'll, we'll start talking about faith. And, and, they'll, and I, time and time again, I, I hear people say, well, I'm done with the church. It's full of hypocrites. You ever heard that? It's, the church is full of hypocrites. People who say one thing but do another. And you know what I say? You're right. We're all hypocrites. Because to some degree or another, and Jesus knows it well when he says beware in Matthew chapter 6, that we all like to perform. We all like to put on a front of righteousness. We all like to act righteous. But Jesus wants us to be righteous. And what he is really surfacing here in Matthew chapter 6, that the big difference there between hypocrisy and true righteousness is your motivation. It's your heart. Jesus is concerned with the why of why you do what you do. Why do you give to the needy? And so the, the big issue here is hypocrisy. I, and I don't want us to, to miss the point as Jesus gives an example here. He gives an example of giving. And the, the example of giving is to highlight for us what he's trying to communicate about hypocrisy. So let's not miss the big picture as we jump into uh, what Jesus is saying. And he says here in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 2, So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Now, when we look back in ancient practices and when Jesus, when Matthew and Jesus are recording this, um, we aren't quite sure what this is referring to, and, uh, but we can get the idea. It's the idea of tooting your own horn. You know what I'm saying? When we do things to draw attention to what we're doing because it makes us feel good. 
It makes us look righteous. It makes us look like a good Christian. So Jesus is saying when you get out your checkbook to give to the needy, and in the ancient world that we see all throughout the Old Testament, that God had designed and, and, and really uh, given the charge to the people of Israel that they were to care for the poor. They were to, um, and, and, and in the Old Testament system, they were to leave a tenth of their harvest to, to be uh, available for those who didn't have much. And so there was this idea ingrained in Jewish culture that giving was a part of what righteousness looked like, what it looked like to do good things for God. And Jesus is saying, beware, don't be like those who do it for the applause. So when you go to write that check, don't be like the hypocrites who get the big check. I've always wanted one of these, so I made it this morning. Um, you know, they, they, they have these ceremonies of some huge donor uh, giving a large amount of money. They'll give them a plaque in the building. They'll name the building after them. And I, and I want to say this morning that the church has lost its way. As we look at church history, there have been times that the church has lost its way when it comes to giving. When we've lost the right motivation, you go to Old North, North Church in Boston, take a little tour, and you'll hear the stories of how each of those boxed-in pews was purchased. The highest donors had the closest seats. And it goes completely against what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is saying that, that giving, a good thing, giving to the poor, giving to the church, it's all good things. But if you give for the applause, you've missed the point. In fact, it's worthless in Jesus' Jesus' eyes. And we see in this passage that hypocrisy is motivated by religious reputation rather than true transformation. Hypocrisy is motivated by religious reputation rather than true transformation. It's empty acts of righteousness. Hypocrisy is motivated by earthly recognition rather than eternal reward. Hypocrisy is motivated by receiving glory from others rather than giving glory to God. He, he describes how the hypocrites would go into the synagogue or the streets and they'd want to be seen by others when they put that offering in the plate or give to the poor. And what Jesus is not saying in this passage is that public acts of giving are wrong. I, I want us to understand what Jesus is doing. He's using hyperbole. It's a figure of speech. When he goes on in verse 3 and he says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Some people have taken that strangely literally when it comes to giving in the church, but what Jesus is saying is he's more concerned about the heart of giving than the method. And, and I, I want us to not miss the point that Jesus is not uh, teaching us here the method of giving in church. He's really putting us to think about the motivation for giving. And so what Jesus is highlighting for us is that true righteousness is not motivated by earthly recognition. True giving, true, and giving is just an example, true prayer, true uh, uh, acts of service are motivated by faith and not sight. And here's what I mean. Let, let's look at verse 4. Uh, he says, don't, don't, whenever you give to the needy, don't let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing verse 4 so that your giving may be in secret 
then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, uh, what is Jesus saying here? Is he, is he saying you should only ever give anonymously? Uh, I don't think so. I think what Jesus is saying is that true righteousness, true practice of righteousness, is motivated by faith and not sight. You see, sight is focused on what people see, what people think of me. That people will think I'm more righteous. And we put on this mask like the Greek actors did. We try to look like someone who we're not. But faith believes that who we are before God is not some perfect saint. But we are a sinner in need of grace. Faith is grounded in the gospel. In the gospel that says, my greatest value in life is Jesus. My greatest worth is that He sees my acts of service as an act of worship, as an act of, 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 God, of Him working in my life, of His life at work in me. And so true righteousness is motivated by faith, not sight. You see, hypocrites receive the empty reward of earthly recognition. But the righteous receive the full reward of God's recognition. When he says, well done, good and faithful servant. The reality for us this morning is that hypocrisy is in never-ending danger for you and me. Because our hearts are prone to tunnel vision. Our hearts are prone to turn in on ourselves. And I would venture to say that hypocrisy is not merely a deceiving of others, deceiving people to think that I'm more righteous than I actually am. Hypocrisy at the heart of it is a deceiving of ourselves that the recognition of others actually equals our righteousness. And so when we have so deceived ourselves that the applause of others, that the recognition of others, and this is rampant in the Christian community, that we, we equate the applause of Christians with the most righteous in the community, but true righteousness is not motivated by earthly applause, Jesus is pointing us to the continual danger of tunnel vision, of our hearts becoming self-centered, knowing the Christian lingo that, lingo that will make us look better and sound holier. But Jesus is not amused by your performance. Jesus has no regard for earthly applause. Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wasn't, doesn't want you to put on your Sunday best. He wants your heart. And when our hearts are centered on faith rather than sight, we will find a reward that cause, causes all earthly recognition to pale in comparison. It's simply the reward of Jesus himself. When he receives us into his glory and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, the heart of faith recognizes that Jesus is worth more than money, than my reputation, than my feel-good rush of religiosity. Faith places its greatest value in who Jesus is, not on who I am. And faith is centered on grace, the performance-shattering realization that there is nothing I can do to make myself righteous. It is only Jesus' grace at work in me. And so hypocrisy is really grounded in that belief that my performance will earn me something before others. And we buy into the belief that it earns something before God. We buy into the belief that my works earn God's pleasure. That if I do acts of service and people see it and recognize it, then God will love me more. And we wouldn't verbalize it, but in our hearts we are prone to believe it. 
And I, as your pastor, need to hear this message over and over and over again. Because Jesus doesn't want your performance. He wants your heart. In the words of that old hymn writer, come as a beautiful invitation. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His glory, in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You want to keep your motivation in check? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Because when we turn our eyes on ourselves, we find that sometimes we do the right things for the wrong reasons. And Jesus says, that's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. And Jesus is inviting us here. I, I, I hope this is convicting for us. Because to a degree, we all will always wrestle with impure motives. We will always wrestle with, in, with mixed motivations. But what Jesus is calling us to is a continual recalibration of our hearts and our motivation so that we don't get that tunnel vision into ourselves. A couple of applications as we think about this passage in everyday life. I don't think Jesus is saying that you always need to give anonymously, but I would encourage you as a practice of avoiding hypocrisy to give anonymously from time to time. I, a few years ago, was meeting with a buddy of mine. He and his wife were going through a hard season financially. And uh, Mary and I, I had just graduated from seminary. We were, we did, I didn't have a job yet, but we did, in that season, have more than we needed. And after I met with my buddy, I, I thought, you know what, I, I'm going give to give them some money to help them out in this season of life. And so I put some cash in an envelope, and I dropped it by their house. I put it in their car, actually, and I didn't leave my name or anything, and uh, to this day, every time I see that friend, I always want to ask, did it help? Uh, did you know it was for me? Did, did you find encouragement from that gift? And every time those thoughts surface in my mind. I'm taken back to Jesus' words and beware, Peter. Beware of seeking the approval of others, the praise of others over the glory of God. Because doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in Jesus' eyes. Would you pray with me? God, thanks for this word. Oh, how we need it. I pray that we would continually recalibrate our hearts. Help us to avoid putting on a performance. And Lord, we want true transformation. We want, we want our hearts and our lives to, to practice righteousness for the right reasons for you and your glory by faith and not for the sight of others. And so, God, we give you our hearts. Lord, we confess that we are so often hypocritical. That we say one thing, we, we do another. And then, Lord, sometimes we want to act righteous, but you're calling us to be righteous. So, Lord, we give you our hearts this morning, we ask that you would recalibrate them. May you turn our eyes upon Jesus. We pray these things by his grace.
and for your glory. Amen.